everyone. My name is Hannah James and I am the Assistant Curator of Visual Art at Campbelltown Art Centre. Today I am joining you from the lands of the Dharawal people and I pay my respects to the ongoing custodians of this land. The Dharawal people are also the traditional custodians of the land on which Campbelltown Art Centre stands and where this exhibition takes place. Dharawal people's deepening connection to culture and customs have cared for this country for over 60,000 years. We acknowledge elders past, present and future for their immense spiritual connection to place that was never ceded. Dharawal land has also, has always been recognized as a meeting place for, me, for people from other lands. And in this spirit, we respectfully continue this tradition through the bringing together of our communities through arts and culture. Currently on exhibition, now virtually at Campbelltown Art Centre, I Am A Heart Beating In The World, Diaspora, Diaspora Pavilion 2 is an exhibition partnership between 4A Centre for Contemporary Asian Art and the International Curators Forum and Campbelltown Art Centre and is curated by Adelaide Bannerman, Jessica Taylor and Michaela Tai. The exhibition considers the navigations, imaginings and lived experiences of six artists who belong to the diaspora. These artists are based in the UK, the Caribbean and in Australia. This is our final of three Wednesday lunchtime artist talks and today we are joined by Daniela Johannes in conversation with exhibition co-curator Michaela Tai. These talks are Auslan interpreted by Paul Houston from Sweeney Interpreting. Daniela and Michaela will be in conversation for the next 20 minutes or so. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and they will try to answer them as they go. We will navigate through the exhibition virtual tour as they speak, and we encourage you to explore this further in your own time. I'll now hand it over to Michaela and Daniela. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Um, my name is Michaela Tai, and I'm one of the co-curators of the exhibition. I'm coming today from the beautiful lands of the Gadigal, and I hope you've all had some time to go outside and take a deep breath and um, thank those for the custod ongoing custodianship of this amazing country that we live on. Um, today, I'm really excited to be finally talking to Daniela. Um, Daniela and I are both part of this exhibition. We have been working on this show since 2019, talking about it for even longer than that. And this is actually our first time live speaking, thanks to COVID. Um, so finally, the conversations we've had online are able to happen in real life. Um, Daniela is joining us from the French Caribbean, which is being quite a um, time zone fun trip in terms of this exhibition. Yeah. <laughs> um, just before I introduce Daniela, um, before she gets started, I thought we just have a little bit of a look. Um, one of the works we're going to be talking about in depth today is this work here, which is a video work and an installation called Atopias. And this work really, um, for me, it's really characteristic of Daniela's exploration and her practice. And there's two main threads, I think, of her work. And I think she'll be able to explain on that a bit more. But one of them is the idea of the unseen, what we can't see. And for things with um, the experience of diaspora, the unseen is very much just under the surface. You're always feeling connected to something somewhere else. And you're always really aware of the links and the ideas and the stories that just hover and they can't be touched and they're not tangible, but they're very much impactful. Um, and the other part of her practice, which sort of sits as a, a twin to this idea of the unseen is the very much seen, which is the object. And the idea that objects can hold really potent and powerful memories. They can signify new futures. They can signify connections. And this work here in this installation, which Hannah is very um, walking us around in um, deftly, really brings these two things together. So you've got the real solid idea of this bed, but also this video, which is sort of really a, um, a great expo um, visual exploration of the unseen. So Daniela, do you want to talk about how you, you made this work and these sort of two ideas that go behind your practice? Sure. Um, I'll just firstly, I think, um, begin with uh, uh, the unseen. For me, I've often, uh, in the past, I've uh, described the unseen as forces um, that are constantly at work on our minds and on our bodies. 
um, and in the context of the film, uh, which is set in the natural environment, um, for me, I'm really kind of alluding to the idea that um, the unseen reside there. This is where you can um, access it. And, um, and uh, you have, a, there's a, a part in the film which will appear shortly, um, which is this kind of liquid, an explosion, kind of an eruption of this liquid matter that's continuously pulsing throughout the film. Um, and for me, that's a kind of um, representation of like the magic authority of femininity, the, the like kind of the primordial mother, um, the archetype of the mother. And, and so there's this kind of conversation, this relationship between this liquid matter and the protagonist, um, essentially it's communicating to her and kind of drawing her and calling her closer uh, until she ends up at the ocean. She gets to the sea, to the sea, and uh, merges into the the ocean. And it's a kind of healing and a reconciliation for me. Um, but the film, as well, I think my practice in general as a whole is really a pretext um, to cultivating a rich inner life and for me to kind of find some healing. Um, that's what the film, um, it serves, uh, it serves a purpose, yeah. And as for the, uh, the bed, the installation, there's definitely a connection with these two very different things, um, which I think I'm sure the audience are probably struggling to make those connections. And, um, Unfortunately, you know, due to the pandemic and not being able to be there to um, maybe execute things in the way that I would have wanted. Um, I think this is a great, and it's very new for me, installation, it's a new kind of um, direction, I'd say. So um, th there's, a, there's a connection there, which is uh, this idea of, um, dreams, what is dream, reality, fake, false memory, real memories, uh, these two things. But um, it's also, you know, I'm, I want to explore that further. And, um, and I think this has been a great opportunity for me to test those two very different things out. Um, but my ambitions are to extend that into more objects and really introduce um, kind of lots of um, paraphernalia, books and photographs and um, objects that we use in everyday life that have come to mean something very sentimental to me. Um, and all of these objects are connected to um, these different lands and terrains that I've lived in that have impacted me. And so uh, for me, it, this is the, the kind of vision for, for this work is to, to have that. And that hopefully would you know, give clues to the audience also. It's just dropping these clues and trying to make these connections between, you know, this screen and then this bed and this, the room. Um, yeah, so, it, and then we see the protagonist out there like walking and that, that um, you know, the idea is that it acts as a kind of window. You know, she's, she's no longer in this room. She's traversing these landscapes. Um, and kind of, you know, kind of delved into nature, you know, and I think that for me, this idea, we have to, how can I put it, we, I try to, um, I would, I hope that the film allows people to really kind of think about it and question. I know that I've had friends ask me, you know, well, where is she going? Why is she walking? Why, what is this intensity that's, you know, uh, that's um, you know with the sound design and um, and I think these are good questions um, and 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 you know her 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 going into these spaces for me is much like the um, runaway slaves of the Caribbean you know who fled into nature and these for me it's the refuge that nature can offer you from like the hostilities of uh, society. Um, yeah, sorry, I kind of rambled, but no, that's great. Uh, well, yeah, I hope 
It, um, I think it was so sad that you weren't able to get to Sydney to see the show because those conversations that you talk about when I've been standing in that room listening to um, visitors talk about your work, they have been trying to piece the puzzle together. Like, what's the connection? Um, what's this? And the discussion of um, the sort of movement through that thick foliage has also been, some people find it quite confronting and, you know, frightening. Other people are like, no, it's a sanctuary. Um, and listening to those conversations, um, I'm sad that you couldn't hear them, but they were definitely debated in Australia. Um, and another thread that comes through quite strongly um, throughout the exhibition is quite a few of the artists do engage with water and end up at a place where there is water. And just wondering for you, what was the reasoning with, with that? Why is water, and even with that sort of liquid, um, what is it about water that's so powerful, you think, in this exploration? Um, I guess, um, you know, I've lived in many different places. Um, I've been away from the UK for now maybe over 10 years just over 10 years and so I've been to different places and while I'm grateful um, you know also for uh, the kind of uh, safety that the UK offered me and my family um, that I've been confronted with much much um, kind of hostilities much um, oppression I would say and um, and and also just my you know, my parents, my background, I'm Ethiopian, Eritrean. Uh, there's many layers to uh, many places I can call home, but then that feeling of, you know, I'm not this enough, I'm not that enough. I think those that's not uh, unique to me. I know that many people feel that way. Um, and the places where I think a friend asked me, you know, where is home, you know? And I struggled to answer that question, but then I came to realize that for me, it's uh, the places I felt most home is is in bodies of water, is in uh, is in in the intimate relationship with with nature. When you go to the river, you know, when you climb the volcano, there's you know, nature offers you that. And um, so the the ocean is that, but it's also it's like a birth a birthing place, you know, the womb of uh, the mother. But it's also in the film, um, I've just finished shooting the second later because we're I'm in the middle of editing it, but the ocean in this film acts as a portal for her to continue this journey. So she enters the ocean and then in the second film, she exits from another and she's in another new terrain. And, and it's this continuous entering and exiting from these different portals. And it's essentially, um, you know, I'm trying to, um, you know, kind of, I'm interested in talking about freedom of movement, you know, and these ideas of borders. So that's the, the and even the act of this movement is one foot in front of the other, you know, it's, um, it's incredibly healing. The actual film itself, the making of it as well, um, was a very cathartic experience for me, yeah. I think, you know, in this moment where, I mean, in Australia particularly, our borders are very shut and have been shut since March 20, and we've got a very long and chequered history of complex um, borders, water borders around our country. Yeah. Um, but the water here is, is kind of really hopeful because it is borderless. There's an idea that you can travel anywhere um, by the sheer force of where you can imagine. And that's really, I think, something that, in the diaspora, the fact that you can go into the water where you are, but imagine you're in water somewhere else, the feeling is the same. Um, it's kind of powerful. Yeah. And especially for us, Australians, I think, where we're all so much of our lives are pinned with water for all of us that live on the East Coast. Um, but no, it's been it's really amazing to hear you talk about that because some of the ideas in this, in this work are, are really quite complex. The, the film itself, um, follows the protagonist, but has this idea of magical in there as well. Mm. And I'm just kind of interested how, how have you played with that idea or how did you want to have um, this kind of yeah. magicness to yeah. it? Mm. Um, 
I think that it's the film made itself. You know, I set out. In fact, I set out to make one film, and I ended up making another. So um, I'm the, trying to go back and think now. But um, essentially, you know, I've changed. There's a shift in colors. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I've darkened it. Um, you know, there's. Um, I'm not sure if you can remember. There's a part in which um, it's very, very dark, and it's almost like stars. It's like sparkling. You know, um, and and I've really engaged. That's those that that's actually black sand. Um, so the magic is there, you know, it's all around. If you're willing to see it, there's no real, besides the kind of changing it of the colors, um, you know, these are where experiments that happened, um, you know, on days when I went to the beach with my children, you know, and noticed, observed the environment, observed the, you know, black sand. I'm not sure if you have black sand there, but it's kind of, um, magical, you know, it's got, uh, it's almost like glitter on the floor. Um, and I just started to play with, you know, making experiments. But I think in some ways I wanted to make, uh, kind of transform the world that we are in, like make it into something else. Um, and I think also create this sense of disorienting, this is it dream, is it reality, playing with these ideas. Um, and um, yeah, I think I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but no, you have, um, and it's yeah. really interesting. Last week, we spoke, I spoke with Layla Stevens, one of the other artists, and she also has this like truth um, fiction that kind of um, welded together within the work, and it's really nice to unpick it and see how they sort of sit together. Um, I thought we'd see, we're going to we're already. Got, only got 10 minutes left so I thought perhaps we'd have oh. a look at um, your other work um, just really sure. briefly um, because this we could talk about this one for ages but yeah I think so <laughs> <laughs> the series of um, images that you have presented in Campbelltown um, a series of self-truths they are kind of a work in progress and I think when we were talking to you the curatorial team was talking with you you were like really um, I'm going to show you these. I can't imagine them in this, like how um, I've kind of designed them to be quite small. And then we, there was sort of discussions about what they would look like, this thing that you had originally um, were just playing with in a digital fashion, what they would look like in a you know white gallery space. And I like the idea that there's a, there's a work in the show that is part of an ongoing research project. It's an ongoing thing where you're sifting through images, personal imagery, but intercepting that with others. And I'd just like to hear a little bit about, you know, where you are in that process. And did you feel like you were revealing a lot to have these up um, at this stage? Um, well, I, yeah, I mean, it caught me, it definitely surprised me because I, I never intended them to be in any kind of exhibition, as, as you said. Um, you know, I began the, doing the very first ones in 2017, um, but the ones from 2017 are not in the exhibition, they're from 2018 onwards. Um, but, you know, I created them when I was heavily pregnant, uh, that's when I started to work, and also uh, just before moving to Guadeloupe. So it was really, I didn't have the, the studio, uh, I'd given up my studio, um, I was really very limited as to what I could do. And at that time, I was spending a lot of time with my family. That's where I was um, staying. And, um, and it was a return home, which um, was really lovely. It was nice to spend time with your parents. And, um, but I, I was aware that, you know, I've, I'm pregnant. I have, there's this new generation coming into this world. And then kind of also looking at my parents who are, you know, at the end of their lives and making this kind of bridge between those two things and feeling myself uh, as almost uh, responsible to transfer and pass on culture, knowledge. Um, and so I started these kind of dialogue with my family, trying to um, learn more, you know, as much as I could. Um, 
about their experiences, their experiences uh, of childhood, of migration, just wanting to learn. I, I even uh, went as far as uh, trying to learn uh, to, how to write and read in Tigrinya, uh, which is, we have our own alphabet in Ethiopian literature. Um, so, but during that time, I could see that these, what I wanted, these conversations that I wanted to open up were too difficult for my family. They weren't always willing to engage in all of them. So, hence, I kind of had to respectfully, you know, take more time with that and treat it with a little bit more care. And I stepped back and tried to, um, you know, I'm, I think I'm always asking, I think if you're, at least for me, I'm, you know, I've been in so many different places. I'm from the diaspora and I've, um, want to I've always been scratching at this trying to dig and figure out you know who I am you know because for so long people are telling you who you are or what you are not and in some ways I think this work was like trying to get into these ancient histories but who were we before Christianity or what, well, what was before Islam and or what was happening before that and I came across this connection between the lost land of Punt and Egypt and the lost land of Punt is a region which uh, spanned a large area of the Horn of Africa, which was modern day Eritrea, Djibouti, um, Northern Ethiopia and Somalia. And uh, for me, it was very powerful. And um, there's not a lot of information out there, unfortunately. I think it'd be amazing to, uh, you know, go out there with a the team and like start excavating and trying to you know, uncover these mysteries. But uh, for me, it was trying to build a bridge between that ancient past, which I possibly could have been, a, could be a part of me and my people um, to, to the present, this, these kind of links between past, present, future, or imagined realities. And so it's really not completely clear in my mind just yet. That's why I'm allowing myself it's the only work that i have um, that i allow myself to continuously do uh, and and just see what comes out of it and it, as long as it kind of takes um, yeah and it's and it's also super enjoyable like yeah very enjoyable to do so yeah i think it's really interesting that you say that you know you spoken to your family and i think for people who are second third fourth fifth um, generation of the diaspora when you ask your elders for information there's some stories that they will never tell um, for many reasons and you become quite clear that there's going to be no answer or this is not the way to go if you're asking questions um, and then that sort of movement into imagining what could be is a really fascinating way to um, explore history and I think you know for many people who are from the diaspora things like ancestry.com do not trace those people um, that only tracks a very certain um, familiar lines it really doesn't cover you know global idea of documentation because most people did not document um, yeah. so how do you fill the gaps and I think this exhibition and your work explicitly really um, delves into the idea of imagining a history for yourself and your your generations that have come before you um, in a really beautiful way and now we've only got a few minutes left and I'm really aware there's um, a group um, listening from Campbelltown TAFE and I'm always interested if you can talk a little bit about how you actually made these works um, and I think what key here maybe just to sort of zone in on with the few minutes we have is when we asked you can we show these how did you then move them from what you had been working on into something that could be an exhibition? Um, I remade them, essentially. I went back and I, because I have many folders in hard drives where I collected, um, it was a case of just recreating um, them. But I think over the course of these of years, I started off with these very small um, you know, collages that were super small files. And I, I was aware that I should probably go big, I should probably take more care. So I did. So a portion of them were fine, but then a lot of them I had to recreate them. Yeah. 
So it's just on the computer. But initially I started, I should do an advert for Samsung because the very beginning I was doing everything using my telephone, like anywhere I could, like, you know, because I was pregnant and I, I was, you know, it was difficult. So I was, yeah, like at the bus stop, it's an opportunity and I was working on them. So it was, um, yeah, they, they could be created any time and place. You know. I think that's, um... Any artist that works in the digital medium, there's always a moment when you're like, oh, I probably should have done this in a different format, but I've already gone too far. <laughs> I think that happens to most yes. people. <laughs> um, another question here. Was, with your video work, this is a question from the chat. How did you create the smooth following of action of the protagonist? Is it, it feels both handheld, but also drone-like? So how did you actually shoot? No, um, it was um, handheld, um, but we had a, uh, is it a Vona? I don't know how to say it. I'm not technical, um, but it's basically to steady the camera um, and to complete, to track the, to track the movement. But even that, we, we had a lot of technical difficulties. Um, yeah, a lot of things went wrong. Our team was very small. It was like three people, including myself, and we had to put on the, you know, this syrup <laughs> all over uh, my body. And so it was, it was very challenging. Um, yeah, it was just a, a handheld um, camera with, with a stabilizer. But, but because of the darkness, because of the light issues, we often um, were uh, having difficulties with focus. So you see that the protagonist, like sometimes she goes in and out of focus. But we kind of lent into that and made that a part of this disorienting feeling and just used that into the story. Yeah. No, sounds great. Um, that about pretty much wraps up our time. And I'd just like to say thank you, Daniela, for um, joining you. and being part of DP2. And we're really sad that you couldn't come to Sydney um, to meet us all and see um, all the responses to your amazing work. But it has been really great to have you as part of the show. Likewise, it's been lovely to be a part of it and uh, yeah, really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi everyone, and I'd just like to quickly thank Michaela and Daniela for giving up their time today to do this talk. It's been really, really lovely, Daniela, to hear from you about your work directly. That's really exciting. And thank you to everyone else at home who's joined us here today. Thank you. Nice.